Come gather round the campfire and hear our ghostly tales of chilling terrors, darkest woes, and anything that goes bump in the night. So cuddle up with your best friend or dare it alone. The darkness is closing in and spirits are calling your name. This is Fireside Phantoms. What do we got today? Well, so um, you and I talked about a couple episodes back, um, diving a little deeper into some Ed and Lorraine Warren cases. Right. We had a vote on Instagram. I remember right. that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the winners were... The uh, Werewolf of London. And Annabelle. Annabelle. So for those of you who are not entirely sure who Ed and Lorraine Warren are, you can go back a couple episodes and listen to that Uh, us talk about them but they were like the pioneer paranormal investigators they were from connecticut ed was a demonologist and lorraine was a psychic and they would go and investigate haunted houses and they have many 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 cases that they've documented and a lot of them and i would probably maybe not the majority but a lot of them have been turned into movies Mm -hmm. like amityville like the conjuring like annabelle um lots of them and there's another movie that's just coming out or was supposed to come out in june i'm not sure if it did which was another one of their cases the devil made me do it so they've had a whole lot of crazy ghost stories in their lifetimes sadly they're both passed away but uh when we did our um ed and lorraine story a few months back we asked our listeners uh, what they wanted to know more about and these were the two that came up excellent excellent let's dive right into it well, I'm covering the uh, the werewolf one, oh. and <laughs> I talked briefly about this when we did our Ed and Lorraine story um, a while ago, and um, so just so you guys know that um, this is an actual condition called lycanthropy, and it's basically when somebody um, feels that they have become a werewolf or they've been overcome by the spirit of a wolf, and so that's kind of what the story is about. It's about this guy um, named Bill Ramsey. And when he was a sweet, young, innocent nine-year-old boy playing out in his little hometown of South End, England in 1952 in the summertime, he was out there playing and having a really good time. And as he was playing, he said he felt an icy, cold wind accompanied by a very terrible stench wash over him. And he said it felt very, very strange. He said after he was overcome by this wind, he had this urge to fall to his hands and gallop around on all fours like an animal. What? Yeah, very weird. He became overwhelmed with rage. Very angry. So his mother came out to check on him. And he had suddenly a nine-year-old boy. He has superhuman strength. And he pulls out a fence post that was cemented deep into the ground. Oh, wow. And started to swing it around. And his mother looked at him in shock as he growled at her and gnawed on the chicken wire from the fence. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, pretty crazy. So both of his parents were watching him at this point and they were like, what the hell? Our child is crazy. So they ran back into the house and locked all the doors and just watched from the window. <laughs> Did they really? Yeah, they were they totally just freaked left out. Left their kid out. They there. were totally freaking out because he was growling at them. He was chewing on the wire. There was blood dripping down his mouth. He was throwing shit around. He was having a huge temper tantrum. I seriously would have thought he had come down with a case of rabies. Something. I mean, I would yeah. seriously think that. That's what you would think because he was so off off his rocker that they were just like what the fuck so eventually he did calm down and they brought him back into the house and they cleaned him up and everything and uh never happened again they were like okay this was just a weird thing that he did we don't know what happened those mickey mouse pcp stickers (laughs) he was given by the mailman yep exactly he probably ate a mushroom and then just kind of went whoa But yeah, he had a pretty normal childhood except for that one very weird event, right? Mm. So he grew up and he got married and he became a carpenter. And that was his trade to get through life. So, but not long after he got married, he started having some very weird dreams. He had these weird dreams that he was chasing his wife and she was running away from him in terror. Oh, wow. (laughs) And he would wake up from these nightmares covered in sweat and panting like a dog. Like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah uh, right weird 
And what was his wife thinking? I don't know. They never really talked to her. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, so you guys, there's a lot of information now about this guy um, because all this happened in like the 80s. So 1980s. And so there's a lot of TV shows that did stories about him. He's, he's kind of well known, actually. But they never interviewed the wife and asked her what the fuck she thought was happening. That's too bad. Yeah, I know. I know. The dream soon passed away. So he didn't have them anymore. His life returned to normal again. The, he and his wife had a couple kids and they just did, you know, regular family stuff for like another 15 years, which is a long time to go. Yeah. Another 15 years goes by and one night Bill goes out drinking with a couple of his buddies and they're sitting in the bar and he notices that same terrible icy feeling wash over him just like when he was nine years old. And Ew. he remembers it because he's kind of like... um, this is weird. I remember this feeling when I had that weird fit of rage when I was nine. And he doesn't tell his friends anything. He just calmly gets up from the table. He's like, I have to use a restroom. He goes into the bathroom and he said he looked in the mirror and he saw a wolf staring back at him. So scary. So weird, right? So he is starting to really freak out now because he's hallucinating. Like he looks in the mirror and he sees a wolf and he's starting to go, "Uh oh, this is not good. So he goes back to the table and he tells his friends, look, I'm not feeling well. We have to get out of here. And they're like, oh, OK, no problem. So they they leave the bar and they get in the car and they're driving back to their homes. But it's too late. Bill has gone into full werewolf mode and he starts to growl and snarl at his friends and he starts to bare his teeth and he twists his hands into claws and then all of a sudden him and his friend are in the back seat. He, he lunges at his friend and he starts to bite him on the leg. How scary How to be attacked by your friend like that. I know, right? And none of them know what's going on. They're like, Bill, what the fuck? Calm down. And he's like, <laughs> you know, and he's all over them. And so the driver stops the car. And, you know, Bill Ramsey's not the biggest guy in the world. He's like 5'7 and 150 pounds. So he's not huge. But he was so incredibly strong that it took everybody in the car to get him off of the guy in the backseat. Like, there was a bunch of guys trying to pull him off, and he was stronger than they were. Wow. That's how intense this was. So anyway, they were eventually able to get him off the guy and, um, like, calm him down. And finally, he came out of the attack, and he had zero recollection of anything that had happened. He, That's he, interesting. He, just, he was full wolfy. He was full wolf, and he just totally had blacked out. He had no idea what had happened. He's like, what do you mean I attacked him? Why would I do that? Like, yeah, he had no clue. No clue. So he, you know, didn't know. Now, was he craving rats that, or game at that time yeah. when he was he in He never full mentioned wolf. that. Well, he, he wouldn't remember, said. probably. Probably not. Yeah, he, he clearly wanted human we blood. Just check his breath. Yeah. So 18 months later, on Christmas of 1983, Bill was not feeling well again. And he thought he was perhaps having heart problems as he had chest pain. So he went to the hospital to get checked out. However, while he was there, he started to realize that these chest pains were turning back into that weird feeling that mm. he had had at the bar. And so he's like, oh, fuck, this is that, that weird feeling I'm having again. But before he could warn anybody, a nurse leaned over him to check his blood pressure and he bit her on the arm. <gasps> so he was in full transformation, for full force again, full wolf transformation. He jumps up from the hospital bed. He's burying his teeth and growling again. He's got his fingers curled into claws. His body is arched over like a, you know, like a like a back, wolf, kind of like a wolf. And he's like running through the hospital and he's snarling and snapping at anyone who gets in his way. And people are trying to stop him, but he's just too fucking strong. Like he's got the strength of 50 men. He's like, nothing can stop him. So eventually the police were called and they were able to get him into handcuffs and sedate him. But it was a real struggle for them to do this. And once again, when Bill calmed down and came back out of it, he has no memory of any of this. No clue. That's awful to know you are a holy terror. And, yeah. you know, it's yeah. one thing to get drunk at night and pass out and be like, oh, I embarrassed myself. But how do you tell people? Like, that you, and then do people believe you? Like, really, you didn't really know what you were doing? Yeah. But, I mean, it's such a crazy state of psychosis that you have to wonder. I mean, he genuinely thinks he's a wolf. Yeah. 
Well, my question is, did he look like a wolf? I know his body was contorted. That and... is coming. That is coming. Okay. It's kind of interesting. So he says that his he never grew excess hair and his teeth never got any longer. But Lorraine does speak to some of that a little bit later. So um, a few months later after this hospital incident, it happens again. He starts to feel that attack coming back on and he's nervous because he knows... I could hurt somebody. I don't know what to do. This sounds like a medical issue. I can feel it happening. So he goes back to the hospital. And the nurse who saw him got very nervous because she had heard the rumors. She knew who he was. And she's like, dude, I'm going to go get a doctor. I don't want to deal with you. And it was too late by that point. He attacked her and he attacked another staff member. He was full transformation again into the wolf. So again, he starts running around the hospital wreaking havoc. And again, the police are called. And they went about trying to corner and capture and handcuff him. But he's so strong, he's able to fight them off for a while. He is so strong that he actually injures one of the officers so badly that the officer had to stay in the hospital for four more days. Whoa. Yeah. So he's a real badass. And like I said, he's 5'7 and 150 pounds. He's not a big guy. They should have turned that into a, like an extreme sport competition <laughs> or something. How to catch the werewolf. So, and then once again, after he calmed down, he has no memory of what happened. In 1987, Ramsey once again transformed into a werewolf after he apprehended a prostitute. So apparently, I don't know, it's kind of a weird part of the story. Apparently he saw a prostitute and decided to turn her into the police. So, what? yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know there, but he, he sees this girl. So these werewolves have... <laughs> I don't know. They're I don't making know. citizen arrests. Apparently, yeah. He saw her and was like, what the hell? And so he grabs her. He said, I'm taking you to the cops. Maybe she uh, propositioned him. Who knows? So anyway, he puts her in the car. He's taking her to the station. And as he's driving her there, he goes into one of his attacks. And she is starting to get really freaked out because he is he's acting all deranged and crazy. So when they get to the police station, she jumps out of the car. She runs into the building and she goes, I need your help. This guy just drove me here and he is wild. He's nuts. So the cops are like, what's going on? She's like, he thinks he's a wolf or something. So they go out there. This one, one cop goes out there and he's a real big dude. He goes out there and he sees Bill and he said that Bill tried to hit him. But then the officer retaliated by kicking Bill in the balls, which we all know when you kick a guy in the balls, it, they, they go can, down. They go down. Mm -hmm. So to which Bill stumbled back for a second. But then he took a deep breath. He stood back up. He came back at the cop and he was even stronger than before. And did he kick the cop in the balls no, back? But he lunged at the cop and he took that six foot whatever cop down to the ground and the cops started yelling for help and the other officers run out there bill ramsey is sitting on this guy's chest choking him to death a dozen officers had to pull him off of this officer and they took at least two injections to successfully sedate him Oh, they shot him with a tranquilizer. Yeah, they, they did. They tranquilized her. You know, that stuff takes down bears. Well, I think they were using... And they did two? Well, I think they were using human sedation. But oh, it needed okay. two of two tranquilizers to get him to go to sleep. And, and then they had a 12 cops to get him off of the officer. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? So that did it for the cops. They were like, we're over it with this werewolf dude. He keeps fucking everything up. So they took him to the local mental hospital, dropped him off and said, sayonara. However, the doctors and staff at the mental hospital ran every conceivable test on Bill and could not find what the problem was. Hmm. He was not on any drugs. They could find nothing medically wrong with him at all. So... They did what any good person would do. They hit him on his butt with a newspaper and put him back out on the street. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. No, but they did They did release him and said, we, we don't know what's wrong with you. And um, so he left. As time went on, Bill's werewolf attacks became more and more frequent. During one of the attacks, the police put Bill into a holding cell that had a very small window inside of it, 6 by 12, in the door. So he um, was in the middle of an attack. They put him in there. He pushed his head and his shoulder and his right arm through that tiny window, and he was trying to grab at the police as they walked by, snarling and biting at them and trying to crawl through that tiny window. Oh, he's a shapeshifter or something. Almost. Have you, uh, remember that X-Files episode called Tombs where the guy could stretch and go through tiny little spaces? Yes. That's what it makes me think of. 
they um, ended up, again, having to give him two shots of sedation to get him to go to sleep. Then they had um, four firemen and two police officers had to soap up his whole body to slip him back out of the window. I was going to ask you, did yeah. they have to break apart the door to get him no, out? No, they used soap, but the um, in the documentary, the cops said they had to use some quote-unquote considerable effort to get him out of the window. Because he was lodged in there so well. That is so freaky. Yeah. Once again, Bill has no recollection of any of this. So Bill was very worried about what he was doing during these attacks, as anybody would be. And mm-hmm. especially because he had no memory of what he was doing. He was really concerned that he was really going to hurt somebody. So he finally got to the point where he would feel the wolf transformation starting to happen. And he would just get his ass down to the police station as fast as possible and say, it's happening. Put me in a cell and lock the door. And that's what they would do. They would put him in a cell, lock the door, and just let him stay in there until it had passed. Okay, how long did this happen where he was doing this? Over the this? course of, well, the whole thing from, I think, the, the first bar incident, not counting the one time in his childhood, but the first incident at the bar through all the way to the end was nine years. This plagued him for about nine years. That's that yeah. is awful. So yeah, they would the cops knew him and they were like, Yep, no problem, Bill. We'll put you in the cell and lock the door and then you can have your time and, and then when you're done, we'll let you out. And that's how they worked it out so that he didn't hurt anybody. Wonder if he had an affinity for like the K nine unit. <laughs> I don't know that they had a K nine unit oh. back in those days. About this time, the press was starting to get wind that there was an actual werewolf loose in London. Well, not really London, but in Mm -hmm. southern England. And it had their interest peaked. So the press started to run articles and interview police officers on TV about this werewolf that had attacked them. Uh, The footage of these interviews were shown on TV in America and just so happened to catch the attention of one Mr. Ed Warren. Yes. Mm, Here we go. Okay. Yep. So as he's watching this show about this werewolf, he thought to himself, there's no way in hell I want to look into this. He and Lorraine already had a lot of people scoff at them for being ghost hunters. He thought Mm -hmm. if we get involved with a werewolf case, we're really going to lose credibility quite a bit. However, Lorraine also was watching the same show and she had very different ideas. She was like, you know what? If this guy has superhuman strength, as they've said, That would mean he's probably been possessed by a demon. And that is definitely in our wheelhouse. So he probably needs our help. And that's how she saw it. But there was only one problem. Um, They didn't know exactly where this was happening. They knew it was in England, but they were not quite sure where. So Lorraine decided to figure it out. So she contacted the producers of the TV show in Los Angeles who had featured the segment on Bill. Um, The producers confirmed that Bill was indeed a real guy who really did transform mentally into a werewolf. So she and Ed uh, flew to England. She did not know for sure which precinct had dealt with the werewolf. I'm not sure if the TV show could not tell them that information or why, but they they got limited information from the from the producers in L.A. So she and Ed flew to England to look for where this was happening and She had a picture from the TV of the patch that the officers had worn on their uniforms Mm -hmm. to help her kind of narrow down where to go. So they went to London, which is where they thought it was, and they had 52 precincts to go through to find this guy. Wow, that's some diligence. Yeah, right? So she starts going around to all these different police agencies, and they're all looking at her like she's crazy, like, lady, there's no werewolf here. And um, she's trying to explain to them what what's going on and they're like well they start giving her information like it's not our agency but perhaps it's this other one and they give her giving her phone numbers and oh that patch might belong to this agency here's some phone numbers to try so she's collecting numbers as she goes through looking for this werewolf Mm -hmm. she's kind of exhausted all the agencies in london Um, No one seems to know what she's talking about. So she gets herself a fistful of quarters because back in those days there were no cell phones. So she gets a pay phone. That's right. And Mm -hmm. she sits down and she just starts going down this list of phone numbers that she had collected from these cops. And she finally gets to one phone number and she explains to the operator um, what she's looking for. And he's like, oh, hold on a second. A couple minutes later, another cop answers the phone and he goes, oh, so you're looking for a werewolf, huh? And she was like, oh, my God, I found the right place. Like, she was so excited. Oh, wow. So, anyway, 
And they found they had a hit. It turned out that this werewolf was located in South on Sea, England, mm -hmm. which is in southern England. And it's like a couple hours away from London. So she was so jazzed that she found them. So um, she and Ed headed out to South on Sea and they met this officer who confirmed the werewolf story. And he told them the guy that you're looking for is named Bill Ramsey. Well, Ed wanted, of course, to meet Bill. But he didn't want to do so without some protection because obviously Bill is a dangerous guy. He can transform into a werewolf-like person anytime and go and do crazy shit. So he asked one of the officers that Bill had actually attacked if he would accompany them to meet Bill. And this officer stood, he was 6'3", he weighed 250 pounds, and he said, hell no. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere Smart near Bill. Smart man. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere near Bill. He said being attacked by Bill was the closest he had ever come to being killed on the job. Oh, He's yeah. like, no, go fuck yourselves. I'm not going near that guy. So Ed asked a couple other officers to come with them, and they all declined and said, you're on your own. Sorry, dude. And that made it very clear oh. to Ed that the cops were really scared of Bill. So he was like, oh, this will be Yeah, that's not a good sign. No, then. Not I would be like, um, <laughs> Lorraine, let's get that plane ticket booked and head back to home. <laughs> yeah. I don't head think this is going to work out after all. Yeah. So when they did contact Bill, they told him who they were and that they wanted to meet him and they thought that they could help him. So uh, they said, let's meet at this pub, this very public pub, <laughs> so that we're not alone with you. And so that's what they did. So Ed and Lorraine went down to the pub and Bill came up to the pub with his wife and the four of them sat down to have a brew and to talk about the fact that Bill was a werewolf. <laughs> can, can, can we just say how awesome his wife is for sticking with wow, him? Wow, right? Maybe back in those days, you know, women were like, no, I said through sickness and in health. And so here and I am. And werewolfness. <laughs> and werewolfness. It doesn't matter that you're a werewolf. The Warrens, when they met Bill and his wife, they told him that they believed he was possessed by a wolf spirit and that they could help him by having a priest perform an exorcism. And Bill was kind of like, what? Come on. Are you kidding they kept talking to him and telling him that they think that this is really what's going on. They're, and, you know, he just was like, this just sounds like a bunch of kooks, right? Mm -hmm. So he wasn't really initially interested. He was more like, but he was also desperate. And the mental health doctors were not helping him. They, they couldn't tell him what was wrong. And so Ed and Lorraine were like, if you just come back to the United States with us, we can arrange to have an exorcism for you. He thought about it and... They're like, you don't have to pay for it. Well, will they arrange the sponsor to fly him over to the States? So he thought about it and he's like, you know what? Might as well try it. Nothing else has worked. I don't want to live my life like this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's a free trip to America. So why not? So he said, okay, fine. I'll, I'll try it. He and his wife boarded a plane and they flew to the United States. However, the trip did not go down without some heavy drama. The night before the exorcism, Bill tried to kill his wife. She was asleep next to him and he tried to strangle her to death. Oh, wow. And somehow she got away from him, but I don't know how. I don't. I didn't get much details about that story, but she finally got away from him. She probably had a pair of scissors pointed in the right direction. Maybe. I don't know. Or maybe she slept with a gun with a silver bullet under her pillow. Anyway, that did not stop the exorcism from proceeding the next day. So Ed and Lorraine called their friend, Bishop Robert McKenna, to perform the exorcism on Bill in the Catholic Church the next day. The first 30 to 40 minutes of the exorcism seemed to be somewhat uneventful, with Bill looking bored and unimpressed. <laughs> but at one point, something changed, and the wolf spirit took hold of him. Lorraine said that she saw Carol, the muscles in the back of his neck become bigger and thicker, and his ears begin to point. Ew. So she did see a physical transformation taking place. His lips curled up, and he tried to bite the priest. He began to contort his hands into claws and snarled and growled at McKenna. McKenna just kept trucking along, repeating his Latin rituals, and standing over Bill with the authority of God Almighty. Finally, Bill tried to leap out of the chair and to attack McKenna, but I, I believe he was either handcuffed or held down by the others in the room and he wasn't able to reach the priest. Mm -hmm. But it was a huge upsurge of rage when he tried to attack the priest. Eventually, though, he settled back down and the exorcism came to an end. Bill said that during the exorcism, he felt the wolf spirit leave him and he knew he was going to be okay. 
It made him believe that he had indeed been possessed. After the exorcism, Bill went on a number of TV shows and talked about his experiences. His last public appearance was in 1992, in which he said he had no more lycanthropy attacks or werewolf attacks. For their part, Ed and Lorraine Warren were given a medal from the Essex police for their part in helping out Bill and resolving their werewolf issue. I'm glad they got a medal because that whole police department wasn't brave enough to even help I don't, them. I don't and... think they knew what to do. Yeah. And... I mean, they just had to lock him in the cell, mm -hmm. when, you know? I don't know. I don't know how else they would handle it. So anyway, that's the case of Bill Ramsey and the uh, the Southern England werewolf. That's a fascinating story, and I purposely didn't know anything about it. I didn't want to know before you told yeah. your story. I haven't seen any movies or articles on it. It's pretty cool, and I sure hope that, you know, um, is it New Line Cinema that's making all the Warren cases mm -hmm. into films? I sure hope they do that one, because that would be really interesting. I Somehow I think it did come out, but it had a very limited showing. Hmm. So it was only, I think, like at a smaller theater. To, well, to me, that has feature film written all over it. If I'm a movie mm -hmm. producer and I'm seeing that story, I'm like, oh, hell yeah. I can do plenty of material with this. Right. Yeah. I'm going to pause this for a second. I got to take my sweater off. So are we ready for Annabelle? I'm ready for Annabelle. Okay, great. <laughs> so many of you have heard some details of Annabelle in our last story with Ed and Lorraine Warren. I'm going to take a deep dive into the case. So Annabelle is a doll that's about three to four feet high. It's a Raggedy Ann cloth doll. Uh, many of us as kids had Raggedy Ann dolls. I did. They even made an Andy doll. Too. I know. He was also very cute. So the mother purchased a gift for her college-age daughter. In some stories, her name's Donna. In other stories, her name is Deidre. So I'll be calling her Deidre. Um, and she got this doll from a hobby store back in 1970. Deidre was a nurse along with her roommate, Angie, and they worked the same shift at the hospital to keep each other company. So her mother, uh, when asked, you know, why would you give your college age daughter a doll? She said, well, it was just a novelty item. I thought it looked cute, maybe sitting on her bed or as decoration, you know, um, yeah, dolls just, were a big thing. People would yeah. decorate with dolls all the time. Yeah, I know. Till they realized that they were creepy and possessed. Yeah, that fad changed, thank God. <laughs> yes. So her roommate, Angie, would first see the doll change position slightly. And then when they would come home from work, they would find this doll sitting on one of their beds or in a completely new location of the part of the apartment from when they left it. One time... The doll was sitting in a strange position that it couldn't have been in on its own because, you know, cloth dolls don't have much form. Yeah. So they thought that was really odd. Like it was striking a pose or something. It was. It was weird. And Angie's fiance, Lou, hated the doll right from the start. Noticed there was something very sinister about it. Mm -hmm. And so he'd be like, put that doll away or like, get the doll away from me. He could tell there was he something wrong. He just did not like that doll. And... After a while, they just were very suspicious that somebody was probably playing a prank on them. So they checked all the windows and areas that an intruder could possibly be getting into. Um, but they decided nobody had access to the apartment while they were gone, except for, of course, the landlord. Right. So what they did is they set up booby traps. So this is like Home Alone yeah. part five or something. Yeah. You know, they had all these booby traps around so they would know if anything was disturbed. Okay. So, and it hadn't been. Okay. So they knew that no physical person was entering. Right. That's and a good exiting. way to. That's a good way to tell. Nowadays, if this happened, you would put up like a teddy camera, camera or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the weirdness kept escalating. Parchment paper with handwritten notes and childlike handwriting with a pencil. Uh, these notes kept appearing on tables and countertops in the apartment, and these messages were cries of help, saying, "Help us." Or help Lou written on them, which hmm. is weird that they would say help Lou. Yeah. Neither of the girls had any paper matching the parchment. So they thought that was strange. Like, yeah. where did this paper come from? And they said they only had pens in the house. They didn't keep pencils. Huh. Um, and so that creeped them out a little bit. Would you be moving at this point? 
I guess it would depend on how much money no. I spent on the house. No. Okay. <laughs> that but answer no, but is I, no. But I would I would be really freaked out about being there by myself. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So how about now? One night, Annabelle was found on Deidre's bed after the roommates came home from work. The hands had blood on them. Yeah. Well, and, then the doll is definitely going to be yes, eating. Yes. Yeah. And blood seemed to be oozing out of the doll. Like the stigmata? Mm-hmm. Oh, fuck. Yeah, they would hear whispering, feel icy cold spots in places, and see shooting lights and orbs. There was also knocking sounds, and their beds would rattle and shake. But the blood oozing out of the doll, that's a whole new level. Yeah, thats I didn't realize that Annabelle had blood coming out of her Yeah, I didn't either. So that was Mm. the trigger for a medium to be called at that point. Okay. So the medium that they invited in told them a story about a seven-year-old little girl named Annabelle Higgins, who died in a field years ago right in the area where the apartment building now stood. The medium told them that the little girl meant no harm and she was just scared. She loved their raggedy Ann doll and wanted to live in the apartment with them. So after hearing that story and feeling sorry for the little girl, of course they agreed to invite her to stay. So the medium is evil. (laughs) That's where I'm getting. Or the medium got the wrong story because in reality, people have researched this. The girl Annabelle Higgins died in a car accident, but the medium was close to the right story because it was on the same street. Okay. So pretty close. Yeah. And the two roommates you know, now knowing who was haunting the apartment, um, they weren't scared at all. So they decided... Well, yeah, it's a friendly ghost. Yeah, so they decided to call the Raggedy Ann doll by the dead girl's name, Annabelle. Right. And they would even invite the doll to dine with them in the kitchen, allowing the doll to sit in a chair with them at the table. Both of them would talk to her as if she was a real little girl. Ugh. They would take her on drives in the car. They would buy her clothes. They would even buy her jewelry to make the doll feel welcomed. In return, the doll would give them little gifts back. I bet. I think I talked about one of the gifts uh, was a piece of yummy chocolate. Yeah. Yeah, I think you told me that. The demons know what we we love. Right. Chocolate. So one time the girls witnessed Annabelle's arms, which were resting by its side, lift up and rest on the kitchen table during breakfast. Oh, hell no. I would not be staying with that doll. So she saw this Mm -hmm. and she's like, but it's just Annabelle. So it's fine. It's just Annabelle. It's just a little girl. She's living in the doll. Yeah. Hell no. No, no. And the fiance was like, oh, hell no. Lou kept insisting. He did not like this doll. I like Lou. He needed the doll to just be gotten rid of. He's like, this doll got got to go, girl. It's either me or the doll. Yeah. Me or the doll. Team Lou. Yeah. Team Lou. Well, things started to get really bad for Lou. I bet Unfortunately, they did. Oh, I yeah. bet. Oh, I bet Annabelle wasn't pleased with what he was saying to uh, her new family. Not at all. Oh. The first thing that happened to Lou was terrible nightmares. Mm-hmm. He had nightmares that the doll would crawl up his leg and sit on his chest at night trying to choke him to death. Ew. One time, he picked up the doll after a dream, and while the roommates were cleaning, threw it across the room saying, you're nothing but a rag doll, Annabelle. You can't hurt anyone. <laughs> At that very moment, the furniture moved, and the picture frames fell off the wall. The doll also physically attacked Lou one time when he was searching for the source of noise coming from a closed-off room in the apartment. The girls thought they heard someone moving around and were really freaked out about it being an intruder. Lou listened at the door of Donna's room and after hearing slight rustling, quickly opened the door to catch the culprit red-handed in the act. Have you ever done that? Like, I'm going to catch you. Yeah. But the room was quiet and nobody was there. (laughs) Except Annabelle, of course. And she lunged at him. The raggedy Ann doll was sitting on the floor in the corner. Mm -hmm. Do you know when you get the chills? Mm -hmm. Like someone's watching you? Yeah, usually when you're telling me a story like this is when I get the chills. So Lou felt that and quickly turned around and was physically attacked with an unknown force striking out at his chest, leaving seven claw-like scratches (sighs) down his skin. So he didn't see the doll actually move. He just felt the force of it. Okay. The scratches were deep and painful, but quickly healed within two days. And they, they made a comment about that, that these wounds were not typical wounds that you would get in an injury. They burned, but they healed incredibly quick i mean they were super deep but they just closed over within two days as if 
he was probably never scratched. Lou is probably um, super like spiritual and high vibrational and maybe he had defenses against the evil. Yeah, maybe he had like a guardian angel maybe. going, yeah. how dare you yeah, attack my he little being, Lou? He was being protected by something because <laughs> he could look at the doll and go, uh-uh. Or the other two girls were like, oh my God, let's take it for a drive and get some ice cream. No. Yeah, they were no. practicing mommyhood before mommyhood. Oh. So knowing whatever was in that house meant to harm him and injure the girls, they decided finally to contact a priest, this time from a nearby Episcopalian church. This priest knew the Warrens and asked them to the house because he determined just by talking to the roommates that this type of activity that they were describing called for an exorcism. Mm. After the exorcism was performed, which, by the way, wasn't like the exorcist, it went pretty fast and it was completely uneventful. Okay. Which a lot of exorcisms are that way. They don't really fight back. The Warrens decided, though, that the doll should go with them and they removed it from the house. It was Ed's opinion that the spirit was a demon pretending to be the little girl of Annabelle in order to be invited into the doll. Objects that are haunted usually cannot be cleansed in the exorcism and are forever tainted. Well, let's hope Grandma's diamond doesn't ever need an exorcism where we have to give that diamond <laughs> bye-bye. That, yeah, that would really suck. suck. That would suck. Totally. Be like, um, let me just take this diamond from you. <laughs> it's haunted. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ed said haunted objects like Annabelle are a danger to people. And, you know, even if you took the object and you removed it, even within a few miles, the evil spirit can still find its way back. Okay. And it will try and make its way back to the owner. So um, they had the demon exercised from the doll. Mm -hmm. And then they took the doll away so the demon couldn't find its way back to the doll. Right. Okay. So on the way home, the Warrens started to experience car trouble. Mm -hmm. The engine wouldn't start. So the demon already found its way back to the doll before no. they left. <laughs> and then the car would stall at lights. They had several near-miss collisions with other cars, and at one point when the car stalled for the third time, Ed decided to get out of the car and pour a vial of holy water and bless the doll again to make sure they would make it home safely. Huh. They did return home safely, but Ed sat Annabelle in a chair next to him as he worked at his desk. Bad move, Ed. Bad move. <laughs> the doll levitated up into the air several times, but then after a few days showed no signs of movement. But whenever the Warrens went out of town, they would come back to find that the doll was sitting in a different room of the house. Oh, no. Yes. They even decided to lock the doll up in Ed's office building, but the doll would be found sitting in Ed's favorite recliner chair when they got back home. As if to say, fuck you. <laughs> I thought you were going to say whenever they go out of town, they would give the doll to their daughter to snuggle with while they were away. <laughs> oh, their daughter, Judy. We, I can't thought, imagine. We thought, Judy, you might like this doll to cuddle with while we're gone. <laughs> I would, I would, if I were their daughter, I'd be like, get that doll away. Get that doll the hell away from me. Annabelle also seemed to have a friendship with a black cat <gasps> who would oftentimes appear beside the doll. Huh. On one occasion, Ed said he saw the cat prowling around the floor, acting like it was scanning the bookshelves for some good reading material. Is this the same cat from the house on Blythe Street? I, you would think <laughs> right? these cats accompany Just makes its appearance the, in all these places. Yeah, it would accompany, you know, all the disturbances that are going on. So you know, he this cat was just prowling around and it was like looking at all these objects in mm -hmm. his office mm -hmm. and then looking for like what he was having as books in his bookshelves. It was really unsettling. Hmm. And then the cat was sniffing around and decided just to come back and sit by the doll's side. Then, as Ed was watching, the cat would then dematerialize, growing faint from the head down and disappearing. Really? Huh. And this would happen. It would just appear and then disappear. What book do you think the cat was looking for? Pet Cemetery. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Is the cat a good guy or a bad guy in this story? It's a bad cat. Oh, shoot. Okay. It hangs around with Annabelle. Well, he did disappear. He left her. He went, he came, he obviously was, he was obviously looking for a book. He went around <laughs> looking at all the different titles. Nope, my book isn't here. 
happened to go back and sit by the doll and then he faded away. He's probably just fine. You just love cats. I love cats. <laughs> but especially black cats. Yes. So Annabelle didn't cause too much trouble except with clergymen or people who made direct threats or took too much interest in the doll. Lorraine said she would not even look the doll in the eyes because it was so scary to her. Mm. In wrapping up the case, the Episcopal priest who helped out, uh, you know, with the exorcism with the two nurses, called the Warrens to make sure everything was still okay. During the phone call with Lorraine, they heard growling and loud sounds happening throughout the house. Uh, uh, no. As if it was listening to no. their conversation. Mm -mm. Yes. On another occasion when the Warrens were working on a different case, a priest, Father Daniel, had dropped off some notes to Ed and wanted to show off his brand new car. While he was visiting, he was also curious about Annabelle. Mm. He had heard about the exorcism and he picked up the doll saying, quote, God is more powerful than the devil. And he tossed the doll back onto the chair. Ed and Lorraine gave him a warning not to do that again. And yes... Ed said, God is more powerful, but he told the priest, you are not. Mm -hmm. They both told him to be very careful driving home. Mm -hmm. Well, he ended up wrecking his new car when his brake system failed. Oh, interesting. The last thing he saw, he said, was seeing Annabelle in his rear view window. Ew, creepy. That story makes me shiver. That's so creepy. That is like, That's like a, a scene movie. out of a movie yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's more. Oh my gosh. Uh, I know. Another time. She's a, been busy. She, <laughs> yes. Another time a homicide detective was helping the Warrens on another case. He looks around the museum and they know they, at this point, they had a lot of haunted objects and said the worst thing to him in this whole museum was that doll. He told Ed he couldn't take his eyes off of it. Well, the phone rang and Ed excused himself from the room and said, OK, I'll be back shortly, but please do not touch anything. When he comes back from the call, he sees the detective is shaking and sweating profusely. Oh, shit. Well, thinking he was having a heart attack, he set him down telling him, look, I'm going to call an ambulance. But the detective said, no, he didn't want to talk about it. He's OK. But he really seemed really embarrassed by the intention that they mm. were giving him. Mm -hmm. And so they suspected that he probably picked up the doll and something happened. After that, the Warrens decided Annabelle needs to be locked up. Yeah. I, I'm surprised it took case. that long for them to lock her up. Yeah. Well, frankly. because nobody, nobody could keep their hands off the doll. And, but she could also move around by herself. Well, like, that's, that's probably the most logical thing. Yeah. It's like, let's keep this doll yeah. from moving. Like, weren't she going to be afraid to go to bed at night that you wake up in the morning and the doll's sitting there looking at you? Like, I mean, that's just fucking creepy. Yeah, I mean, parts of this story, I was like, why would you ever want that doll sitting by you while you're working? Why do you want the doll in your house to begin with? I know it's Ed and Lorraine Warren we're talking I've, about, but I know, still. I've, I've asked yeah. this question, like, why are you keeping all these mm. objects near you? I don't know. That's a good question. Like, what is the point of that? Well, they were asked that and they said it's because they felt it was safer with them. They would routinely do blessings. Uh -huh. And so they're uh, trying to keep all the evil contained in their house. Mm -hmm. So I wonder now that they're gone, if their daughter and son-in-law do that, because he pretty much runs their business now. Yeah, that's true. So I wonder if he has to do that. So back to the story, they did decide to lock up Annabelle in a glass case so nobody would be tempted to pick up the doll. Yeah. But that wasn't the end of it. Mm. A group of college students who came to visit the haunted museum started calling it all a bunch of bunk, knocking on Annabelle's glass case. Mm -mm. So you can't even knock on the case. Mm. They had heard the story of Annabelle and dared it to put slashes on them. Less than three hours later, the boy who taunted Annabelle directly ended up dying in a motorcycle accident, losing control and smashing head on into a tree. Yep. His girlfriend, who was riding with him at the time on the motorcycle, survived the accident but spent a whole year in the hospital. Oh, shit. I don't even think they allow you to stay a year in the hospital these days. Mm, I guess it just depends on if you're in a coma or something. Oh, yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Lorraine's daughter, Judy, said of all the haunted objects they had collected from their cases, Annabelle was the one that frightened her the most. Mm -hmm. After the Warren's death, their son-in-law, Tony Spera, keeps his eye on Annabelle and operates the Haunted Museum. Yeah. Can you go to the Haunted Museum or is it closed? 
I think it's closed now. Mm. In 2020, social media was circulating a story that Annabelle had found a way to escape her glass prison. (laughs) But Annabelle was proven to be resting in her glass prison. And according to Tony, will never be given parole. Yeah, thank goodness. But he did say he's going to take her to that um, convention at the end of October. I know. uh, Yeah. And uh, she'll be on display for people to see. And I, I think we're going to hear some crazy stories. I bet we will. Because that will be the first time, I yeah. think, that she's been brought out into the public. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I don't think they've been having people come into the museum Yeah, anymore. I'm sure COVID is probably shut down if it wasn't shut down before. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, people are going to go nuts to see that. They really are. Yeah. So um, that's the story of Annabelle. Well, that was great. Thank I, you. I'd heard a couple of little of those anecdotes. I didn't know all of them were legit. So that's interesting. It's funny when you research the story and you watch videos of Ed and Lorraine telling the stories, their stories even differ slightly because yeah. that's how memory works. Yeah, yeah. So like her her memory of the story is just a little bit different. His is a little bit different. And yeah. then um, a lot of my story I got from the book, The Demonologist, which he helped to write. Right. And some of those stories are just slightly different, too. Right. So I kind of took all of it and put it together in a way that I feel like captured the most um, coherent message that was the same yeah. pretty much with all stories. So. Right, right, right. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Very cool. Well, thank you. And that um, concludes our first edition of a Ed and Lorraine Deep Dive deep dive we may do another one here down the road but Mm -hmm. uh we hope you guys enjoyed that thank you very much thanks have a good night bye bye yeah it's um growing old sucks for all of those out there who are thinking about trying it i wouldn't suggest it it's not fun So in 1987, Ramsey once again transformed into a werewolf. Sorry, I'm going to have to say that again because listen to my voice. Are you transforming? Holly, (laughs) stay with me. I'm transforming into a prepubescent boy, apparently. (laughs) Werewolf. (laughs) My balls are dropping. Sorry about that. All right. So, yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. Just keep going. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Your heavy panting gets me yeah. <laughs> gets me hot. Maybe babe. that, like, you know. Help, I don't know. Helps his sexual powers. Nobody interviewed her. <laughs> Big hole Nobody in the story. Her. Big hole in the story. I'm ready for Annabelle. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> you bring that creepy doll on in here. Let's do this. I had a Raggedy Ann doll, did you? I did. Yeah. I did have a Raggedy Ann doll and an Andy doll. <gasps> I did not have an Andy. They go together. I know. And I think that's part of the problem. Why? This was only a Raggedy Ann doll. Because I I never got married. She was frustrated. No. Because I never had an Andy doll. (laughs) No. Not a Raggedy Ann doll. Okay. Let's start over over from the beginning. As a bed partner. Carol. (laughs) Carol has been drinking. I have not. You I, have. I just went you, to have a you, big mimosa. You had a mimosa. You had a mimosa. <laughs> you had the mimosa. <laughs> okay, we both had one mimosa. <laughs> but it felt like six. So it doesn't excuse us. No. But they were very strong. Yeah, they were. As the flames die down, do remain undaunted. Though all hitchhikers are ghosts and all dolls are definitely haunted. Hey guys, be sure to follow us on Instagram. Our handle is at Fireside Phantoms. If you have a spooky story you would like to share with us, send it to firesidephantoms at gmail.com and you may hear it on a future episode.